Welcome to the One Within All to a very special episode of Interverse. So special, in fact, that I don't have a pre-prepared introduction to read out to you with all my usual poetic eloquence, but the topic at hand is so interesting. I want to just jump right into it. And we've also got more than one special guest with us today. First of all, joining me for this interview as a co-host is John Coleman from the Apaca to Stasis and Institute for the Humanities website and YouTube channel. John and I have had a couple of great conversations about education and pedagogy in the recent past. And today he and I are teaming up to have an interview with Howdy McCoskey. Howdy has done incredible work on some topics that I've been attempting to bring up on the show where I can, but I think knowledge generally about this stuff is in a very early stage. We're gonna be discussing the amazing phenomenon of the World's Fairs expositions in the late 1800s and early 1900s, as well as what it can tell us about our history and what may have been very, very different in reality from the uh, story that we have received from authority. So it's going to be a very interesting episode. And if you want to check out the video version, I am going to be screen sharing a couple images that help us illustrate the points we're making. Because when you look at these old world architectural wonders, it's pretty compelling. It's not, it's not the same as just hearing about it described, although we'll do our best to talk through the pictures a little bit. And generally, they won't be required to comprehend the episode, especially if you're familiar with the material. But if you're not familiar with the material, there are many good YouTube channels out there, including Howdy's channel, which is Howdy McCoskey Talks. And you can find his website at egyptian-wisdom-revealed.com. And the website's called that because he's got work far beyond just this recent World's Fair effort. He's also talking about ancient societies and cultures and the technologies they might have actually been able to employ to build things like the Great Pyramid and just what the heck this stuff might have been for. It's a really fun rabbit hole. And I think one of the most profitable places that we can put our attention these days, because there is still evidence all around us of these incredible old world technologies and architecture. So you can also find John Coleman in the uh, show notes. I've linked his website as well as his YouTube channel, which is his name. And uh, John, why don't we kick it over to you and let you introduce the topic on your end and then we'll start talking to howdy really excited welcome guys yes thank you chance for that so much fun to to work with you again here on another uh another episode and then uh we're, we're certainly uh, honored to to be interviewing howdy here and we're looking at uh the peculiar uh phenomena of world's fairs in this uh this recording and particularly regarding uh chicago and the book which howdy uh put together on that point and uh a lot of a lot of hangnails and a lot of uh, curious things with the um the official story or the normie story or whatever we want to call it and so that's what we're going to be getting on about and and then related topics to that um to that subject so howdy welcome to the show man how are you doing Thanks. I'm okay. Uh, my leg's a little sore. I had a horse accident a week ago and it's still not fully healed. So if I once in a while look like for the people watching that I'm kind of a little spaced out or distant, it's like this little twinge of pain that's come and then it, it'll go away. So just in case I look, I have a moment of looking strange. That's why I'm looking strange. Other than that, I guess I'm all right. That's a cool way to get an injury though. At least you're doing something neat. Yeah, well, it was it wasn't it wasn't too brilliant. I'll tell you that how it happened. But anyway, so we have we have uh, yeah these these interesting topics of trying to tear apart our history, and um, well, we'll see where you guys want to start with it. Well, Howdy, why don't you just give us an introduction to the concept of the World's Fairs? What made you suspicious about this right away? I'm sure most people have heard of them, but probably never gave it a second thought. Yeah, say, I mean, I actually, for those who don't know, I went to school as a historian, actually. I actually got my degree in history and why I didn't ask any of these questions when I was in university blows my mind right there. Um, and uh, over the course of time, I, I got to, in, in the middle of a depression and, and whatnot. I, I started studying ancient Egypt and in, in detail in the ancient world, went through that, went through experiences with various 
uh, native medicine people and and uh, Zen teachers from Korea, etc. And, and it finished up uh, what had been two books. And in 2019, I was down in Florence and I was looking at the cathedrals in Florence. Specifically, I was looking to see how they might work as energy structures, as energy generating uh, machines. And when I got back from Florence, for some reason, I was just going around the internet and I bumped into the Chicago World's Fair of 1893. And like you, I mean, I'd heard of World's Fairs. There had been one in I'm from Canada. There had been one in Montreal in 1967. There was one in Vancouver in 2010. So I knew what the concept was. But then I looked at the buildings of the Chicago Fair. And these were absolutely massive structures, 700 acres worth of 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 supremely fantastic buildings that looked like ancient Rome, supposedly built in an unbelievably record time, and then destroyed as soon as it was over. And all of that got my interest right away, like something's wrong here. And as I began to look into it and looked at this rough period of time between 1851 and 1915, these things were happening all over the world with the same story. Uh, out of nowhere, build a whole bunch of massive, fantastic buildings, hold these giant exhibits in which history and technology and science and sociology and everything else is presented. And then as soon as it's over, blow the thing up with dynamite. It's the it's the most bizarre story uh, imaginable. And that's why I had to, something just said there's there's an important there's something important here and, and it has to be looked into. And that's the book was yeah nine months of trying to just dig into really the, the strangeness and the stupidity of these fairs. John, what do you think about this stuff? I think that it, it provides a very interesting insight into the 19th century. If it, if it's indeed the case, it's a, certainly a startling uh, conclusion of howdies. Um, but I think a lot of us who've looked at the, at the 19th century have, marveled when we put the 19th century um, in the context of larger, you know, larger sweeps of history, how quickly, um, how quickly technology and, um, and organization and various lines of thinking take hold. It's, it's quite remarkable. And having looked at uh, Howdy's book and, and some of his presentations there, uh, this helps uh, perhaps to explain, um, to explain things. Perhaps the people uh, had access to sources of, of knowledge of the 19th century um, that, that explains the uh, um, lar larger inventions and so forth. So I think this really um, can provide a great, a great foundation to, reevaluating or deepening our understanding of, of that 19th century progress or, or whatnot and putting it into, into a context there. And maybe a part that's been uh, screened out as, as Howdy will and has uh, intimated. Yeah. I mean, the, the thing for me is, I mean, okay, I, I study the ancient world and I pretty much come to conclusions pretty quickly that the archaeologists are lying about the ancient world, that the standard, the standard story was completely false, that the, the structures and the buildings and the stonework and everything else couldn't be done the way they were said. But I, I, I had never continued that to a certain point. I sort of thought the last three or 400 years, well, that history is, well, it won't be correct, correct, but it's not going to be totally wrong either. It's going to be, I always felt that there was, there was, you know, there was going to be a battle of Waterloo. There was going to have been this, there's going to be that. Once I started studying these fairs now, as far as I'm concerned, everything is up for question. Every single thing we've ever thought of as history, and particularly in our in our most modern time here, this, like you say, the the 1800s, the 19th century, uh, which we'll talk about, is the foundation part of almost everything we have in our world now. So why studying this is important? Before we can get into how weird this is, why it's important is because there's almost no uh, what do you call them? Uh, like institution that exists now that isn't somehow directly linked to the 1800s, whether it be law, finance, education, medicine, uh, the military structure, almost everything. It all has its deepest roots of of. Uh, so you're you're figure, you're really learning where we got to, and bizarrely we're seeing that perhaps what these fairs are linking to, or what we're going through right now that we're seeing the same thing happening again, because um, I, I took the fairs as strange, but when I finally went to see a, a building contractor, that's when they got weird for me. And I, and I, I, I met this, this guy, you know, who 
who designs large buildings for his life. He's, he's an expert. And I showed him the pictures of the Chicago and the St. Louis Exposition. And, and it, it just, he couldn't believe that this could have been done. And I asked him, okay, if you're going to build this today, how long does this take? And he said, with modern machines, he said, well, if you give me 50,000 guys, I need two years to plan it because we're talking 700 to 1,000 acres and we're, you know, you're building canals and rivers. This place had, had uh, electrical trains, 1800s, electrical trains, electrical walkways. So he's got two years for that. I need two years to do the landscaping, to do all the digging, to get the water work correct and everything else. Then we're going to need about 10 to 12 years to actually build the buildings. So somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 to 16 years. So then I asked him, well, how could they have built this in the, in the supposed two years in 1891 to 93? And he just said, not possible. Just not possible. Then when I showed him the building construction photos from St. Louis, because St. Louis, the St. Louis Fair of 1904 is the most uh, construction photos. So when I showed him the construction photos, he was very clear that nothing's going on here. There's some scaffolding up against these buildings that are already complete, but there's, you know, you need 50,000 workers. So uh, you're talking like, where are the, where, where are the, um, the, the problem is, is when you sell the building construction photos, there's no sandwich left on the ground. There's no, uh, there's no bathrooms for the guys to go to the bathroom. There's no uh, coffee cup left. It's like, literally it's, it's deserted photo after photo after photo. And he was very clear. No one's been here for years. And this led me then to sort of take us into where we want to go with this. Uh, as you saw, the St. Louis Fair, that's what, that was the largest one, 1,000 acres, which, again, they just blew up and threw into a landfill when they were done, um, was, well, there's only, two, there's only two likely solutions then. There's answer A, the, this thing was really built in the two years they say it was, so they must have had a technology that we don't have uh, or that we, they don't, we don't expect that they had, or B, Many of the buildings had to have already been there, which means we're talking about an ancient civilization, particularly in North America, that is not supposed to have been there, that had structures exactly the same as Rome and Greece and everywhere else at the same period of time. That We may have been talking about a worldwide culture that um, needed, that these fairs needed to, you might say, uh, eliminate from our history. So that that's where, for me, this thing started to take another realm of what are we looking at here with these things? Yeah, I've got some of the construction photos from St. Louis as well. I could pull right. up, but sure. It's like there's so many different points about the fairs that if you investigate, you're like, okay, makes no sense. Okay. Oh yeah. Every no single sense. time I went to something new, it got stranger and stranger and stranger from how the buildings, how they were supposed to be built, what went on at the fairs, uh, what the exhibits were, what the, I mean, these things were like Disneyland on steroids. Uh, as we'll, we'll talk about what, what these things are. And, but like I say, it's important because it's not just a question of history. This is maybe potentially where our current thing we know of as the world and history and everything else was written. This might have been like the uh, before you had television and before you had movies to, they might say, propagandize ideas to the world population. The World Fairs would have been your, your best bet to do it. So, yeah, do you have do you have some construction photos? You can throw them up if you got them. Yeah. And I want to make a, <clears throat> a point about it's not just the fairs either. When you start looking into the history of a lot of cities throughout the western expansion of the United States, you get Salt Lake City, you get San Francisco, several places that appear to have architecture already there and people were just moved in. And uh, we like to play around with word magic on the show a lot. And you blew my mind with the fact that cities aren't built, they're founded, founded. which is found dead. Right. Yeah. It gives a whole new twist to the word Freemasonry. It's right. just wild. Yeah. Yeah. And that like, that'll take you into like, and this is so interesting. Like if you live in the United States specifically, every one of your state Capitol buildings is might as well look like it's from ancient Rome. It might as well, it might as well be from downtown Rome. And it, if you look at the story of when it was built, it's usually built in like 1920 or 1915 when the population of the place it's in was like, I don't know, 25 people. And it's like, A, why do you need to build this? How can you even build it? How can you transport the stuff? There's no roads. There's no nothing. Where does all this material come from? And yet you've got this, oh, this temple basically in, your, in every single state, each one with a story that makes no sense. So... 
like John was saying, as you start to start digging into the whole of the 1800s, it doesn't matter what, what you start turning over, nothing makes any sense to the standard story. The whole thing is, is just, uh, just a can of worms. So here's a construction photo from St. Louis Fair. All right. And what I think is notable about this is that it doesn't look very new. That new? The stone doesn't look new at all. No, I think now I think that's supposed to have become their uh, the um, the one that because at every fair there's always one building that continues on that they say they had to build to house all the artwork and I think that's the one that continued on probably, um, but again you can you, you can see it looks weathered already and where is the, where is the if, if you if you should pull up some other ones the one of the things that he was really clear about my building contractor was that here's a really good photo of it so if you're if you're on a building site and you're building stuff you need to have your materials close by so the standard story of why these things could be built so fast is because they're supposed to have been built with a, a, a uh, material called staff, which is basically a plaster uh, put on top of wood. So supposedly you can build these things really simple, really quickly and really uh, efficiently. But if you're going to do that, you need a lot of wood, a lot of plaster bins, a lot of you know material, etc. Look at this place. There's nothing there. There's absolutely nothing. Zero. And then you see like the buildings, these little buildings in the front, like, okay, that's, that's what people are building at this time period. That's kind of the level of construction. And look at the stuff behind it. Like just, those are only like three buildings at the St. Louis World's Fair. And even to try to build that in two years in 1904 would be a monumental achievement. And this is just like drop in the bucket. But like you see, there, there, there's nothing that indicates this is an active work site. It makes more sense that this is a site that's digging things out of the ground, is refurbishing them, is repainting them, is repairing them, because then you don't need a lot of materials on site. You just need your work crew, your cleaning materials, your paint. You don't need a lot then. It makes more sense that what you're looking at is a picture of a site that's being uh, cleaned up, not a site that's being uh, built. Exactly. And, you know, there's so many construction photos out there, but 90% of them are just scaffolding around. Sometimes it looks like they're maybe adding domes, maybe adding glass to places, which would make sense if these are really ancient buildings, if they had had glass previously, that that might be gone. But yeah, the, uh, the dirt roads are really striking. And in a lot of the photos that I don't have currently pulled up, I, I want people to go explore this on their own because there's so much to explore. But it does look like the buildings were dug out or partially dug out in many cases. Yeah. And of course, the number one thing you would do, right? We'll get to John in a second here. I can see he's got a question waiting to go. Uh, we'll get him. Back. But it, it, the first thing you would do is if you're built and, and you can do it with the, with the photos, supposed construction photos of your state capitals, too, is that they've built the building with this monumental stone and whatever they built it with. But they didn't think to build a road first, a proper road to bring the materials in to make that to make the logistics easy. Like the first thing you would do naturally build the road, but there is no road. So everything where you look at it, it's just. It's just stupid. Yeah, John, you're 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 biting there at the bit. Go. Yes, yeah, great setup, guys. Um, we, uh, specifically about the question or about the the pictures that Chance um helped uh, help bring up just now, um, and and just the whole World's Fair, and and even we can apply it to other um other events of that decade or around those decades. Howdy, um, yeah. but specifically, you seem to be most versed with Chicago. Where do the, the municipal corporations, where do the town of Chicago now, what's the official story as to where the money came for, uh, for those, those extravaganzas? Like, where did the funding come from, just according to them? Okay, let me just make sure. I'm just going to pull out my book because I want to make sure if I get something, I say something, I say the name right. But let me just go into it. So I have, because, you know, I can't necessarily, I don't remember everything off the top of my head always. But um what is really strange about Chicago is that there was also at the same time a big Rockefeller um, University building project that was going on at the exact same time. So it's not just they're building the World's Fair, right? The 700 acre thing at Jackson Park. Nelson Rockefeller decides that right beside it, he needs to build a, of course, gothic looking, massive structured University of Chicago because, you know, we don't. We don't, we got all these extra workers. We don't need to build the World's Fair too, you know. So so you've got you've got that angle. The the actual money is coming from 
it's supposed to be like a few specific, how would you say it? Um, like for example, the, 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 that fair was supposed was supposed to be, and I don't believe the story that there was a battle between would should Chicago or New York win the World's Fair. I think it was it, it had been decided Chicago for various reasons. This was just the story, but in Chicago, it's claimed that the the businessmen who were found funding the the fair was Charles Schwab and uh, the big railroad baron John Whitfield Bunn, uh, the very person whose uh, whose attorney was Abraham Lincoln. So had been Lincoln before the war. So that's and and along with uh, Chicago banker Lyman Gage. So that's that's who you're looking at. So you're looking at two, basically two bankers and and they're in a railroad baron. But the new the people in New York who were supposed to try to get the fare from New York were J.P. Morgan, Cornelius Vanderbilt, and William Astor. So we're talking about big names of of the time involved in these in in, try, in supposedly putting the money together for this. Now, when it comes to the money, we have a problem, and that's because, for example, we take it back to the first big, really big fair in, in uh, the United States, which is in Philadelphia in, in uh, 1876. That fair lost $4 million, which, as you can imagine, is a massive figure for 1876. It lost a ton of money. And you would think one of the ways rich people stay rich is they don't lose money very often. Their things make them money. So it lost money. And they decided, let's do it again. Let's pump in all our money and do it again. And again, every single fair lost a massive amount of money. None of them, none of them turned a profit. So it's already indicating that something else is going on. This is not what it, uh, not what it's supposed to seem. What, uh, what are we looking at here? This is, oh, the Philadelphia fair. Yeah. Yeah. I just went ahead and uh, Googled yeah. that while you're talking about it because they're just, these images are just really amazing, even the ones that are drawn. Yeah. And, also, please and notice the uh, the clouds up there, too. There are some very interesting illustrations in the clouds. I was just going to say, and it's like all of these things around the fair, is it's all teamed with mythology and this 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 almost like it's – and so everything in a painting like this is is critical. You know, this is – nothing is here by accident. And they always like to show this historical thing on the left side of the page. You'll see this for Chicago a lot. The sort of like the nothing in the city. The city is empty. It's a few Indians and a canoe. And then here comes George Washington and sort of the, the, the story of the American Revolution. And then all of a sudden, here are the buildings of the World's Fair. And this is the kind of mental progression they are actually presenting at the fair to, to, to explain how they got there. And I'm going to, I'm going to say now why I think that that is. Because I believe, and I can't know any of this for sure. This is the hardest part when we're dealing about this period. Even though we have photographs, we have we have, you know, we have some really useful tools. We don't have a time machine. We can't go there ourselves and verify. We're, we're, everything we're saying, I'm going to say, is a is a is a research speculation. But I get the sense that sometime between what we know of as like the 1820s and the 1850s or 60s a huge amount of the world's population was eliminated one way or another. And these fairs were the, what you might call reset point of bringing in a new group of population or at the very least re-indoctrinating whatever population is chosen to, to or, or chosen or wasn't, wasn't killed off. And these fairs were like the, yeah, the official documentary of this is what you're supposed to believe now story. So if you take that into your head and then go back and look at all of the documents about these fairs, because one of the other things that like Chance and John, if you're really interested in looking into this, each fair, this is blow, blow your mind. Each fair had, first of all, guidebooks made up about it. So like Rand McNally, one of the famous guidebook people, they had the guidebook for each of the fairs. It's like a thousand pages long, which discusses every single exhibit, every single area, every single part of the midway, every, I mean, everything. After the fair is over, there's usually two or three historians that write, again, three to 4,000 page books on the fair. And the first 500 pages or so, it's all about history. History of the United States, history of that city, the history of, of, of all of these kinds of key elements that take you into the fair first, and then you get like 3,000 pages of the fair. So it's also strange that a tremendous amount of written material is poured into fair after fair after fair after fair right at the time. And again, I don't think all of this is by accident. So same thing. All of these uh, paintings that you're going to pull up, each one is very symbolic in what is trying to present. 
this is really important uh, point to pause on the how much language was poured into these fairs, as you say. It's, I mean, can you imagine writing a five thousand page book about anything? I tried to read a fourteen hundred page book from Clint Richardson, and uh, I lost the book accidentally before I got through it. Even though I was trying my hardest, it's just like it was taking some time. Hopefully, I find that again. But my my point here is that man, there's so many points I want to make, but I think. What's fascinating is there's a lot of ways uh, a population reset could happen, especially if you're looking at possibly affluent uh, ancestors here. If we look at current research into birth rate trends in some places right now, Japan, for example, they show an oncoming massive reduction in their society's numbers for a variety of reasons, but mainly because people are too like well off and too busy working to have children or they're too isolated by the way culture works and they, mm, they would rather mm. just kind of like chill out and play video games than get a girlfriend or, or whatever. Some researchers say that the Japanese language and possibly many others uh, for cultures in similar situations could become dead and extinct languages by 2200. And so population and fertility reduction, which we see happening, at least fertility reduction happening right now through a lot of shady means. Do you think that could be a way of doing a slow-mo reset and of, if the languages are lost and you have a new language introduced to the next wave of people, how could history ever survive the real history? Could be. Uh, the problem is when you look at the 1800s, and again, using the United States as a really good example, just because of it's it's supposed to be so new. So that's why it's so. But I mean, you you can look into these things at the same time. The fairs that were held in Europe and and whatever in Australia and New Zealand and the Philippines and whatever, and find similar strange things. But when you look through the United States at this period, what you're looking at is city fires. So every single city at this time frame in the 1800s goes through a fire that pretty much burns their city down. Um, and, but when you look at the photographs, it looks like Dresden in 1944. Um, so the problem is to just say it's something like that. Oh, it's, it's a slow uh, fertility. It's maybe, you know, there's been a, uh, a slow agricultural die off. The evidence that when you look at the, pho the photographic evidence tells me something pretty dangerous and pretty huge took place during that time frame. Yeah. I think so, too. But I wanted to uh, point out as well the, the language aspect. Mm. Sure. Are you familiar, Howdy, or Chance for that matter, with a poem called The Columbiad? No. Um, most most um, Americans are, and so we, <laughs> there's no reason you should yourself, Howdy, but it's very interesting. Uh, the okay. Columbiad was written by a guy who lives down the road in Newtown, Connecticut, called Joel Barlow for, in 1807. Okay. Um, he's more well known for writing a kind of a kid's poem called uh, Hasty Pudding. But in any case, he writes, um, looking at the, the picture Chance put up, he writes this uh, epic poem, very much like the Odyssey or the Aeneid or the Theabad, these ancient works about people fleeing the, the city of Troy and founding Rome, founding, um, I think, Rhodes for the Theabad, and then founding, in a sense, going back home for uh, um, Odysseus in, in the Odyssey. They're kind of all, in a sense, sort of fan fictions um, off of this Troy event. But uh, Joel Barlow in the 19th century writes this, you know, connecting all of this to to America and this, the goddess Columbia is bringing bringing uh, all this to pass. Nobody reads this book anymore. But, um, and my question with that with that setup is for you who know this this uh, particular line of thinking uh, much better than than um, your average uh, skin, where where do you put the goalposts? So I, I suppose on one end of things, um, there's, you know, everything's made up in the 19th century. There's, you know, maybe some new tech found or some, some, uh, something of that nature, you know, and everything's rewritten and, and, and perhaps um, this, this whole narrative is imposed and you have that. And then you have this equally, um, a large uh, thesis, I suppose, um, which is your traditional enlightenment narrative of um, 
you know, things just leading up to all this progress and and even on the uh, the, the mainstream history um, and of the documents at the time, th- there's a certain sense of there's a new reset coming. You have this idea of wiping out the Indians. Um, there's there's a certain argumentation. The Irish famine is is more than just a random event. Um, and, and to your point about um, and chances about, you know, deliberately losing the population. So my question is with all of that, Howdy, where do where do you put those goalposts in the sense of is there any credibility to that um that normie narrative of all because there's a you know me you who's less formatarianism from- credibility to that idea of just gradual progress. Yes, and this idea that the um you know, the enlightenment, because it so specifies everything, including the natural world, is able to therefore harness by that, you know, all of these technological changes, which do seem to start up, you know, at, at about 1800 or so with the industrial revolutions and and so forth. So is my question is, you know, is there any credibility to that that type of narrative where um where you know this trend leads and and then perhaps are these these uh, civilizations that were here as you argue you know covered up by that or is it all are you saying is all just you know made up in the 19th century well uh if anything quick answer would be i would have to say humans are de have been devolving not evolving that we have been going on a giant downward curve for a long long time uh, I can say that because the the time spent in places like like Egypt at the old Toltec and Mayan sites in, in Mexico, the, the the not just the quality of the construction, but the quality of the energy, even after and, and we don't know when they were built. We really don't know who built them. All we know is that they're there, uh, and that we have um, an unbelievable perfection of you know not just the geometry and the mathematics and the that all of that perfection, but it's it's until you get in there and, and spend time in them to actually see what these places do energetically and what they do to the to the mind and to consciousness and to whatever. And of course, we don't have these structures complete. We have partial structures in the most cases, and they are still unlike anything else anywhere in the world. So to me, when I look, to, it's like the ancient what we what we classify as ancient ancient world is almost like a another universe. Another world of of or almost like you might say human, almost like a human perfected um, uh, totality of mind, body, spirit connected together. And then over time, for various reasons, which we could uh, discuss, that's gone down and down and down. And my, my feeling is as we got close to the 1800s, we were this this sort of three or four hundred year period or 500 year or a thousand year or whatever was like a revival of some of this knowledge because again the the buildings themselves be they cathedrals be they star forts be they the domes and the towers and whatever they're all energetic structures and they're all designed to uh, create a okay i'll tell a story um i was when i was studying the the cathedrals i went to nantes france uh on the eastern on the uh, west coast of the, of the country and there were three beautiful cathedrals. I, I did one where I talked about the alchemic box in the, in the one thing that's on one of my videos. But in one of these other ones, the energy was like so clean and so pure. And it's like I could almost see it moving and swirling through the church. And I knew if, if you played the organ probably at the right time, you could see the energy go through the rose windows, which are like cymatic wave patterns. And that would send the, the energetic wave out to the city. But I was pretty clear, you wouldn't need a doctor or a hospital if you were ill. You would just go to, you could just go, we would go to this place and you would be instantly well. Like the, 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 the level of understanding of nature to human to, um, yeah, that's the, I think that's the main one. Uh, uh, that's not the, actually the one I was thinking about. Yeah, I know which, that's the one that's got the alchemic box in it. Also, nice church, but doesn't have yeah, the same we, energy. We pulled reason. up the Nantes Cathedral, at least what Doug Doug. Yeah, if you pulled there. up, I think it's called the uh, St. Nicholas Cathedral, is what it's called. Um, okay, I'll pull that up. But here, yeah, I just Cathedral thought it was St. Because it, it, was, <laughs> it was literally, I, I stood underneath where the, tower, where the tower point was, and I could feel the energy swirling around, not 
it, I can feel it come down and then circle the church. And then it has this rose windows, not at the front, but at the sides. And, and I got the sense that eventually they would go outside. So to me, John, what we're, what we're looking at is a, a, an understanding that was still in human knowledge. Now, it's not that this, this knowledge is gone. There are there are certainly the, the, we'll call them the beings that have put themselves into control positions. They know this stuff very clearly. And there are a lot of humans that still understand it, um, but they keep it mostly quiet because they know that uh, using it or saying too much of this openly can get them into a lot of trouble, I think. Um, and so this, I think one of the things this time period of the 1900s is showing us is our, it's one of the last times when there was more of a, of a completely knowledgeable human uh, species on the planet who had a, had a potentially, and again, I'm saying potentially, we don't know for sure, but potentially had a much deeper connection to just, we'll just call it energy of a heaven and sky and, and, and nature and each other and, and um, and it seems it seems that the buildings still operate in that fashion, but when I go look at buildings that are built today, they're just like dead. There's like nothing in them. It's it's just zero. Yeah, I can't stand modern architecture either. It it just makes me think of being at school and feeling like I'm slowly my own soul is draining out of my ears as I lay my head on the desk and wait for the bell back in my yeah. childhood. But what I think is, this is a really interesting uh, point that people in the 1800s, early 1800s, th theoretically, I think we kind of project backwards our global awareness without realizing that probably 200 years ago, people might not have, e some people might not even known what a state was or if, what state they were in. Or whatever. Oh, oh, I, I would not think that at all. I'm, I'm pretty sure that the people who living 200 years ago were way more knowledgeable than we give them credit for. Well, that could, yeah, that could be. But my, I guess my point is that if you go back, the farther back you go, uh, according to the history we're given by, like the church, European history, for example, there's a an amazing quote from Saint John Chrysostom. Chrysostom, I can't pronounce that name necessarily correct, but this was an important early church father, an archbishop of Constantinople, who uh, supposedly lived between 340 and 400 or so AD. And he says, every trace of the old philosophy and literature of the ancient world has vanished from the face of the earth. So that's been say, said back then. And uh, as as we know, learning and education were pretty limited at a certain time in history, or at least that's the story, to a, a few individuals. And if, if we don't have a literate population or if their language that their old literacy was in has been replaced, I feel like this is how we get uh, a world where people don't even know further back than their great-grandparents, uh, great-great-grandparents maybe maximum, which I think is very a very important thing when you look at uh, other more ancient cultures or look at Tolkien or look at the Bible lineage is always made out to be very important that there's power in knowing your ancestry. And this is uh it seems like one of the best evidences of some sort of a reset is the fact that so few people have any genealogical knowledge left at all. Mm. Yeah. Uh, again, the more I the more I study history, the more I don't believe any of it, and the more I like to think this idea of uh, make the people of the past seem stupid and primitive, and that's part of what these world fairs were doing. That it, it, that idea comes actually from the world's fairs. I mean, they literally had human zoos at these fairs. That's best way to call them, where they would bring people from all over the world. They would bring pygmies, they would bring native Indians, they would bring uh, aboriginals, and they would make sure that they're displayed to the public as savages. And then right beside it would be a place you could get your skull tested so that you could then test the size of your skull against the size of various skulls around the world to show how evolved you are, whether you're one of the savages you've just seen on the in the human zoo or whether you're now a uh, fully enlightened Victorian knowledgeable person. And um, I, I just, the more I, the more I've come to understand that and the more time I, I, you know, I spent a lot of time with native Indian medicine men on the reserves. And um, once you see 
what they start to share with you once they begin to trust you and um, the kind of knowledge that's been kept over time. But even they will say, but it's, we are still nothing compared to the ones who were long before us. They, you know, they, they all say, all the medicine men I've known have always said, the, the medicine, the, the, if you had met someone 500 years ago, they, they, they would be far, far greater than I can ever be. So everywhere I've gone now where I get information is telling me the opposite of the story. It's that, again, not that things were so poor in the past and we've, we've come so far. It's the opposite. It's that things were pretty amazing. And what happened to it? What happened to it all? What happened to what happened to us? While we're on this subject, and then I'm going to kick it back over to John. I want to ask you what you know about the possible uh, knowledge of Native American tribes, so to speak. They're called tribes because even that word almost (laughs) belittles them into some sort of primitive status. But that I've uh, encountered information that, for example, the Cherokee lived in the buildings that became plantations or uh, Southern slave owners later. And that even there are, when you look at sometimes images of chiefs of these tribes, they're wearing like European style colonial clothing, and maybe they were even slave owners and are engaging in commerce. What do you know about uh, the pre-existing people in the Americas living in cities from either the, either just anecdotally from uh, tribes that you've spoken with or from, something that's actually maintained in the historical record that's just not well known. Yeah, the problem with that line of thinking is when I was spending my time with all these Native people was many years ago before I'd ever thought of this subject as being something I I should be asking these people to see what they would know. My guess is even if there is information, it's either been like everything else wiped out of their their culture that it's been you know the, the the native indians you might say got reset themselves and those part of those residential schools and all the things that they went to were to make sure that whatever knowledge they had of their past was like in a sense beaten out of them so it's forgotten now it's not all gone i know there are one or two there the elders call them elders so you know they I, I never got to meet them i just got to hear about them so some of these stories might still exist but it's, it's a question I've had for a long time that if the thesis is correct, that these buildings are thousands of years old and that there was a civilization living in North America, were the native Indians that civilization? Did they somehow get, get blown out of these cities and they became what we now consider nomadic lifestyle because of what happened to them? Were they already living a nomadic lifestyle? And there were sort of like two civilizations uh, living side by side. Like you say, when you look at things like the Cherokee and and uh, even even things of the Seneca and, and information of the Mohawk and the Iroquois, there, there, there's a, the story, the story doesn't add up to the images and the, and the information and, and whatnot that come from the time. So, it's it's a it's still a question mark because I don't really have an answer for it, and so I know that some native um, peoples somewhere know the answer to that question. Um, we I just haven't heard it yet openly. John, you're an education guy. What do you think about having knowledge beat out of you instead of put into you? <laughs> yes, I mean the. Um... That's that's so often the case with with that system because it it's so well uh, as as we spoke before chance uh, a while back you know even on the individual level you have the disruption of of the individual so often in their just their daily routine um, to say nothing of of you know their their stability at home leaving the home and and this sort of thing um very very novel in in human experience uh and then i was thinking to to merge it with with our discussion today excellent point you bring up there chance um the type of dislocations that we see with with immigration and so forth that are happening in the 19th century um, all over the place on top of the wars and on top of the the famines and and the genocides and and whatnot and it to use um, a word that howdy used in his introduction to his his book um, a reset you know and we've used it indeed ourselves and uh, it's hard not to see a certain uh, agenda altogether in this time period that we're talking about. Um, 
And then just to the native point, just to give a specific one, we think of those those Indian schools that that did such um, such damage to the transmission of culture or to the essay that you and I talked about a few months ago, the murder machine, um, where the same sort of um, deracination happens to the Irish once the English um educational system is is implemented there and the same sort of thing happens in germany with the prussian system and onwards and onwards and onwards and then just to just to add on top of that of course in the united states at that time this is when we're dealing the same period we're dealing with the orphan trains where you're dealing with hundreds of thousands of these supposed orphan children that nobody knows who they are where they came from and are just shipped on trains out to somewhere in the western part of the country and at the same time, they're building these massive insane asylums, like insane asylums that are bigger than uh, bigger than Medici palaces in Florence. And they're 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 just beautiful and ornate. And the question is, a why do you need such ornate palaces for uh, for insane people? And then two, why are there so many insane people all of a sudden? What what are these people? And I get the sense, like John is saying, you're seeing all of these things pieced together. It's part of this reset. If the whole thing is that the, the new the new the new narrative is coming out and if you're not going to go along and you're not going to believe it well you're insane and we're going to see you disappear and you're already starting to see that today i mean think how many just doctors and nurses have to have had to just stop functioning thinking because everything they're being told to do goes against all of their medical training but yet they're still doing it out of fear of a job or belief in responsibility or following orders or, you know, whatever, just like through history, how that's always done. But we're seeing a really good example of how all of a sudden it doesn't take long for certain mental structures and perceptions to get pushed down into the population pyramid, starting at one point and just push it, push it, push it down until all of a sudden you've got, uh, you know, you've got a mass hypnosis on the population and I'm wondering if we we had something similar happening in this period of the 1800s, just done perhaps in a different way, but something, again, we're seeing sort of a mirror right now that we, by learning the past, we're figuring out now, by figuring out now, we're figuring out the past. So in the last portion of the first hour here, I want to show just how easy it is to find evidence that corroborates the same points that how he makes in his books about the fairs and uh, that other researchers have made about places like Salt Lake City and San Francisco. I mean, uh, we're going to talk more about things like mud flood in the second hour, but just in the town I live in, that's a town of less than 200,000. You can find buildings downtown that show very strange, uh, <laughs> very strange qualities, but we'll get to that. What I want to talk about is uh, the town I went to college in, in Missouri is called Columbia. So there's that again, <laughs> the Illuminati goddess as Freeman calls it. And in Columbia, Missouri, this is a town that was supposed to have been founded, found dead maybe in 1821. And I'm gonna pull up this screen share. Within uh, 19 years of the town being founded, let me get this original photo pulled up here. They had already built this building for their university that has these massive ionic columns, Greek looking, Roman looking architecture, right? So you've got a town in the middle of a very low population state. Within 19 years, they've built that with their horses and wagons, right? And surprise, uh, not long later, here's the fire. Takes them out. Right. <laughs> uh, uh, here's a picture post fire that I think is going to be really interesting to you, Howdy, because okay. this photo, just look at this. It looks like the place got blown up with bombs. It doesn't even, or they had to use dynamite to take it down. This doesn't even, maybe this is what they did after the fire and pulled parts of the building down, but it just is very, very bizarre. Uh, and uh, the last photo I'll share will be of, actually, let me show a couple more real quick. I have a few. This is a postcard of an old postcard that I couldn't find the date on. And it's just, my point is that these things look already old in the oldest photos of them. 
here's uh, uh, an old photo of the Columbia visitor sign and see the columns and this crazy domed building in the background that's supposed to be the university. It's just like everywhere we have the same style of uh, architecture going on. Last photo is here they are today and uh, they're, they're quite massive. I, I used to hang out under them. You can see a very small person here at the base of the column. You could fit like 10 people around the base of it sitting on the edge. So anyway, this is just a, a little preliminary research into the topic, just looking at the Wikipedia story and what's still there and thinking to myself, this is very bizarre. And I think people could do this in their own area all over the place. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I just, for example, the, there was a library in Oslo that uh, was just being torn down that looks almost exactly like that. I was just looking very quickly for uh, my photos of it, for example, but it has uh, it has similar column structures and similar. Yeah, that's part of the point. And, and the thing was, is how much we've lost already. Like I grew up in Ottawa, Canada, and there were way more of these buildings there when I was a kid. And slowly over time, they've been removing them to put in a parking lot and a new shopping center and whatever, right? Um, so it's it's also, they don't want people asking questions, I think, and you're going to see more and more and more of these buildings get removed, more and more churches are going to get uh, torn down, burned down, That that's, that's no surprise. They're going to have various excuses as to how, how and why that's occurring, but it's all about, it's all about, um, how does how to, how to try to say this? It's um, um, it's like um, it's like that energetic period is being pushed away from, or that time frame is wanting to be pushed away from humans today. Because I guarantee, when you were at the university, I'm pretty sure you felt really different when you sat under those columns than when you sat anywhere else in the university. Even if you weren't really at that time even not paying attention to energy, you, you probably just felt better. I you always went to the columns calm. to read. I always sat under the columns to read. And I would yeah. migrate around the column to get the shade <laughs> throughout the afternoon. Yeah, because uh, guaranteed the energy was still there. The energy of whatever that building was still existed in that space. It was still held by some of those columns. And as long as pieces like that are there, you still have access to it. Right, John? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, um, yeah, it's almost this, this incremental replacement. Like if you slowly change the picture out, you know, one book at a time, one right. issue box at a time, then you don't notice it. And, um, yeah, that seems to be very much the name of the game in so many ways. I mean, you can see this sort of thing even happen within our own living memories within education where right. different things are are pushed out, new ideas are pushed in, and always the ideas are convenient towards a certain sort of um, uh, or social organization, shall we say. Well, and, let's make this point real quick, too. We kind of touched on it, but a lot of these buildings end up becoming universities, and I think that is a very important point. Like the world's fairs will have universities built right next to them at the same time. St. Louis had Washington university mm -hmm. and then Washington calling it Washington, setting up that entire mm -hmm. mytho mythology in a new area. So I think that's a, what do you guys think? Do you think that the reason that they made these buildings in the universities is because, well, this is going to be the arbiter of history. So the first thing they need to arbitrate is the history of these buildings that they claim that they created. Yeah. Go ahead, John. Start us off. Yes. Well, I think your point about the the asylums was very chilling and and certainly appropriate to today as soon as back then. But I can certainly corroborate what you're saying um, in both directions from where I'm sitting in 10 miles in either direction. Uh, there are the huge former asylum complexes. Uh, Newtown, I already mentioned where Joe Barlow was from. The whole center of town is uh, you know, formerly a, a, a madhouse. It still is a madhouse in a different way, I suppose. And then you cross the border over New York. York and you have again another sprawl looks like a university campus what was an asylum and um and we see that in in other ways with gulags and concentration camps and you know over in Europe and Africa too during the Boer War uh the same sort of thing um yeah again, and when, when we have the university we're talking universe city right that's what the name comes from so universe city is what it's supposed to be so it's already saying it's a city 
It's already it was in the word. A university is supposed to have a city in it. And so it's no surprise to me that they wanted to turn whatever these structures originally were yeah, into the new place where, of course, in the 1800s, people off the street couldn't go to university. You had to be you had to be uh, an elite of a certain level to even get in there. So it was going to be a place now for kind of showing showing the new the new direction that we want everyone to again think because the ones coming out of university would have been the ones 100 years ago that were setting up everything that the population did or didn't do so guys this is a screen share of an insane asylum quote unquote it looks like a castle mm-hmm. and this is an hour's drive outside of salt lake city And it was built not long after Salt Lake City was built. I don't know the exact dates, but you've got a group of Mormons crossing the country. The same people that had the Donner Party incident and had to eat each other because they had such difficulty making the trip. And then within not long at all of founding Salt Lake City, they build this insane asylum. Well, actually, it was a hospital first. I know the building you're looking at. Oh, yeah. yeah this, okay. this, it's, yeah, it's, it's, according to the history, it's a hospital. And then the, after 20 years or something, then it was turned into an insane asylum, according to the story. But and if you look where it is, if you ha- if you had Google Maps or something, it, it's it would be in, it was in the middle of nowhere. Like the population is all over there, but we're going to build the hospital way, way away from where everybody lives and with no transportation and no way of getting anybody there. And on the subject of these buildings having energy, this is considered to be a super haunted building right here, as are a lot of the insane asylums. Right. Well, I don't doubt that. I mean, when when the people that I mean, probably there were, of course, would have been some people in these buildings over time who did have you know serious mental problems. But how many people were put in there almost like the way they were put into prisons and, and you know, concentration camps? So the 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 kind of torture that people probably went through in there is is on horrific scales and there's no surprise that that's lingering through to today so we're gonna put a wrap on the first hour here i want you guys to oh right when i'm talking about torture yeah (laughs) (laughs) yeah let's stop that (laughs) yeah Uh, i want you guys though to finish thoughts for the uh, free hour and also we definitely need both of you to let people know where they can find more of your work and maybe how to give us a clue what's next in your progression. Oh, you want me to go first? Let's have, okay. let's have John go real quick, give his places to okay. find him and then we'll, we'll wrap yeah. up with howdy. Okay. Great. So for my concluding thoughts at this point in the discussion, um, you're, you're certainly um, accentuating certain trends that I've noticed um uh, in the 19th century. So I look forward to to pursuing that a bit more. And in the next hour, maybe getting into some historiographical questions about uh, sources and things. Um, as for my uh, my work, Apocalypsis and Institute for the Humanities, um, we offer an undergraduate level course um, in in the Western humanities, and uh, we'll have to get more books like Howdy's on the curricula too, because it really shake things up. Uh, but we also have uh, pinch classes, uh, you know, standalone classes in Latin and Greek in the autumn, and the legal system, and uh, Beowulf and Weimar Republic, and all sorts of things uh, taught by myself and and some other staff members. So people can find out about the college at apocastestasisinstitute.wordpress.com. And you can write me about any uh, correspondence or questions at apocastestasisinstitute at aol.com. And um, yeah, I guess, uh, you know, mostly I started as a writer. Well, I guess I started just as a seeker of trying to find truth, whatever that was. That's really the best way to describe what I might be. Uh, after three books that came out, which uh, you could check if you use my name and go over to Amazon, for example, that's one of the easiest places to find uh, books that you might be interested in or over at my website as Chance uh, passed on. I'm sure the link will be below because it's such a long name. Might as well find the link and go to it there. Uh, and then the YouTube channel is Howdy McCoskey Talks, uh, which is still there. We'll see how long it lasts, but uh, for now it's, it's still existing. And um I'm kind of reaching a point now, guys, where I've kind of feel like I've I'm completed the first stage now. I'm going to be finished reading. I'm reading my book, Falling for Truth. I'm just going to be finished reading with that in a few weeks. I'll be finished with my 
a section on uh, that I've been sharing on uh, Southern France. And it's kind of like after Easter, um, I, I, I think I feel like I want to go in a bit new direction, not only with the research I do, but what I'm going to be sharing and working with people. And I don't know what that's going to be yet. I'm going to kind of give myself a little bit of time to kind of let the world tell me what's, what's required next. But it, I do feel it's time to make a shift away from where I've been to something new. That sounds good, man. I'm, what I appreciate about you since I started following you is that you're a deeply spiritually attuned guy and interviews on other shows like with rogue ways i really liked that one mm. it comes through and in this one we're really focusing on kind of the nuts and bolts just contradictions out there that are to be found but this you even only came here on a deep spiritual journey a deep spiritual quest and i think that resonates through your work even when you're talking about more uh physical, mundane, real world things that uh, your, your passion for discovering the truth is definitely infectious. I really appreciate your time here in the first hour. We'll, we'll definitely have fun in hour two. I want to maybe talk a little bit about the uh, energy side of things. <laughs> now that we've talked about like, what are these structures? Where did they come from possibly? Now, what could they maybe have done getting into the antiquitech as it's called? And uh, there's so much left on this topic that I'm just really glad we're able to finally introduce it on my channel. And I hope people have their curiosity reignited in the world to realize that it's not as all cut and dry as we thought. There's actually so much more to discover and it makes things really exciting too. So thanks guys. Thank you. How do you like that one? How do you like that one? My attempt at a bad <laughs> pun to kick into the outro here. And man, was it bad. Seems like the older I get, the more my jokes become dad, bad level, bad dad jokes. And I even kind of start to like them. So there's that. And yeah, I did just have a birthday this week. I've got that mystical 322 skull and bones. Awesome date of birth right there around the equinox, which I think is a super powerful time of year. And I think the ancient cultures that we were talking about, and especially some of the things that Howdy has researched about Egypt, would probably lead us to think that these people, our forebearers, were definitely interested in measuring what was going on in nature and the equinoxes and the solstices and following that sky clock thing as closely as possible to make sure that everything that they were doing had, um, you know, that extra oomph of being in alignment and in harmony with the way nature would have done it as closely as possible. That's like what alchemy is really about. It can be applied to everything. And we, you know, when it comes to many of the things we discuss on the show, astrology, tarot, you name it, where did it come from? And it makes you wonder if, you know, if we've, lost things that important. We really don't know where they came from. What else have we lost? And maybe the uh, origin is in the same place. And what I mean is like, maybe this civilization that we are potentially uncovering with this new research, thanks to people like Howdy and uh, one of my favorite YouTubers, John Levi, and tons of others. I mean, I, I'm sure I'm missing a lot. People are probably screaming like, what about this guy? Let me know if you know people who do this type of research. I would like to see more channels that I'm not aware of. So, you know, hit me up. But this could be the clue as to where some of these incredible wisdom traditions might have actually come from. I don't know. Just a speculation. But, yeah, it was a great birthday week to get back to that. I got a cool new set of tuning forks, which our self frequency tuned if you're watching the video, which I hope you are watching the video version of this one because I've got some slides, as I mentioned, that were, I'm sure you noticed <laughs> if you were not watching that we talked about things you couldn't see. Anyway, I, I do really think that I'm transitioning more towards the video format. I'm never going to get rid of the audio RSS feed and I'm always going to try to respect people that like to take in content that way, but it seems like video is kind of more exciting and fun because you have the option to show and tell and not just tell. And a lot of us have been listening to audio only shows for years. And I think it's cool to 
straddled the line where we're not always showing things on the screen. Some of it is just talking and then some of it is presented so that you can kind of do both, you know, whatever flow that you normally would be in to listen to a podcast, you can only briefly interrupt it to take a glance at the screen and see one of these crazy buildings or whatever we might be talking about in a particular video. And speaking of getting into doing more video content, this is kind of a huge deal, actually. I'm moving the plus membership, if you will, over to Rockfin. Rockfin is new to me. I've been investigating it for a few weeks and I finally came to the agreement that will allow me to put my content up there. And it seems like these people that uh, run Rockfin are definitely <laughs> conscious of what has been do uh, done to people on Patreon and other platforms where it's a D platform in your future if you don't toe the line and talk about the right things in the right way. And, you know, I'm not controversial for controversial sake. Probably a lot of my content would never need to be censored by the technocrats if they were trying to keep big conspiracies under wraps. But who knows what the algos do and don't pick up on. And anyway, Rockfin, to give you a bit of a rundown on it, it is going to increase the membership cost if you were to sign up to Plus through Rockfin. But hear me out. It's a $10, $10 a month thing, but you get access to every other show that's on Rockfin. I'm not even kidding. Like if you're a fan of Rogue Ways and you want to get their, her extended content and her bonus show, Middle Path, you would be able to get that on top of being a, uh, you know, being able to access Interverse extended content. And there's going to be new stuff I'm doing over there that will not be available anywhere else. So uh, that is a really good deal for you guys, in my opinion, because $10 a month is more than what you were paying me, but it's still not that much. You could easily, you could easily replace a Netflix with something like this, because I'm not kidding. They have a ton of channels. They're not censoring people. Learn jujitsu techniques, um, how to bake a cake. Who knows? I mean, I haven't explored what's on here, but you bet your sweet ass I will. I'm going to have a field day with... Like just the last couple of days, I was getting uh, a couple of shows are falling out of my rotation that I used to check out and or I've caught up on them or other shows are slow at the moment. Anyway, I just kind of hit a lull where I was like, I don't know what to listen to. And I hung out in silence multiple times today, which is OK. Uh, that's actually not a bad thing. Let's see. Think. But the point is, now that I'm getting into this Rockfin universe, there will be so much that I'm excited to check out and uh who knows, might meet other creators to collab with. I know David Whitehead has been on here with us. He's got his Truth Warrior channel moved over there. So it seems like a good deal. The, uh, the big upside of it is that they give the creators a stake in the company. So basically, the better the whole network does, the more each creator makes. And they're claiming that people are making many times more uh, on Rockfin than they were on Patreon. So... I guess they've done some statistical studies. They're confident about that to put it right on the front page. And I'm definitely willing to try it out because I have no love for Patreon other than the fact that it has allowed me to have the relationship with certain people that have subscribed to Patreon that I appreciate a lot, but really that's more about me and them. And Patreon was a conduit for that. And I'm grateful for that conduit, but I'm not, and I'm not going to close that conduit. What I mean is if you really only want Interverse Plus, you can still do Patreon for $5 a month. I don't expect to actually get deplatformed from there, but I never intended it to be the last stop for my expansion with the show. And so I think Rockfin's definitely an awesome next phase. And I can't tell you exactly what kind of exclusive things are going to be going on there, but definitely I will be having live streams there that will only be viewable there. I know that for a fact. Um, I've got multiple ideas in the works as far as what I might do. And most likely what it's going to look like is on top of your extra hour for every main episode of Interverse on Rockfin, you'll probably be getting an extra live stream per week that's exclusive to there. So maybe not per week. We'll see what I can handle. <laughs> I've already had to take off from my... Uh, other jobs multiple times this week, multiple days, just to get in the other projects I've got going on. I'm super busy, but it's cool. I love it. I love what I'm doing. A uh, lot of diverse projects with my work and other people's work. And 
super fun. One of those was I did Rogue Ways again. I guess I'm like becoming a, a staple character over there, which is fine by me. I really enjoy it. And that was uh, last night, the 23rd, I guess. Today's the 24th as I'm recording this. It might not be the 24th anymore when you hear it. March 24th, 2021. And yeah, uh, we streamed about the I Ching. I showed off my Solfeggio tuning forks. Uh, we talked about the I Ching a lot. I gave kind of an introduction to it and instructions tutorial on how to do it yourself, which was fun. And then we did a, a circle type reading where myself and then people called in and then Lindsay, we all got in on this I Ching action. And the uh, beautiful thing about it is it tells a story from the beginning of the session to the last person, there's like a full circle effect of a journey and consciousness that makes sense. And you can read it that way. So I hope you guys check out that um, episode on rogue. I will mirror it to my channel one of these days soon, hopefully sooner than later. <laughs> it's going to be, I've got my work cut out for me because as you're hearing this, I will have got the Rockfin account set up. I'm going to make sure that this episode goes up there uh, whenever I can get it activated, which is, I think it's basically activated, but there will be a lot of work ahead of me uploading archives. And I haven't decided exactly the order or how it's going to depend on how the upload system works, but never fear, I guess is my point. If you uh, are joining Rockfin, I'm still going to make sure that you have content that you want uh, that might be in the archives from in the past, even if it's not up there yet. What I mean by that is hit me up if there's an episode that isn't in the Rockfin archives yet and you're checking me out through there and I'll see if I can dig up a private link to that particular show or just get it uploaded to Rockfin ASAP and we'll see which one works better. But I definitely don't want to leave the new people that are coming in through this model in the cold in terms of the awesome archives of many, many shows that have cool extensions. And on back to that I Ching subject, I think one of the things that could happen with live streams is maybe group I Ching circle where we do a live stream, people call in, interverse I Ching circle could be fun. And it was really cool doing it with Lindsay. And I'm also offering that now as a like a service one on one, which would be considerably different. And we mold it to what you were trying to achieve, considerably different than doing it with a group over video chat. I mean. If that sounds cool or you want to get in touch with me for any other reason, maybe you make music and you want me to hear it, then please do. Chance at InterversePodcast.com. And I've had so much to announce about the Rockfin thing. And I feel like I barely even scratched the surface of how excited I am about it that I didn't even mention nearly enough how awesome Howdy's work is. And you really ought to check out that book, Exposing the Expositions. It is a page turner with great illustrations not illustrations, photographs, what have you. And uh, also John Coleman. Don't forget that John's work is also available on YouTube and he does great work. And if you're interested in the questions of pedagogy, which means like education of the youth, then uh, and the philosophy of education is really what pedagogy is, I think, maybe. But I know that he does really excellent work over there and covers a lot of topics that might relate to that and society at large. A thoughtful guy indeed, and it was cool to have him riding shotgun with me in this interview and pointing out questions that I wouldn't have thought of, so that was neat. And yeah, we needed to do it that way because Howdy's uh, just moved and his life is kind of hectic, and he gets a lot of interview requests, so he's been trying to bunch them up like that, <laughs> knock out two hosts at once, and I can't blame him. I mean, if I was in his boat, I might do something similar because I would want to be able to connect with everybody that was interested, but I mean, there's only so many hours in a day. <laughs> I was just walking around my house before I came to sit down and do this and thought, oh man, I got a lot of work to do because I just did a remodel. And I mean, I didn't do the reflooring, but my floors got replaced. I would not have been able to fit that in. So that was hired, but uh, you know, you still have to basically turn everything upside down to be able to put in new floors and I've got everything more or less put back where it goes and I'm really loving it. I think you might be noticing a change in the tone of my voice. And that would be because my office now is echoey as hell because of the floors not being carpet. Whoops, unintended consequences. Should have thought about that. 
amateur hour over here. That's life though. Solve one problem, generate two or three new problems. And they're not so much problems, they're quests, you know? So I have a new quest to figure out how to dampen the sound in here. Probably going to have to put maybe a nice rug in, a cool rug. That's probably going to help some padding on the walls. That's most likely what the solution will be. It shouldn't take much to deaden that. So uh, apologies for the echoey, weird vocal tone, if you care. I mean, but if you do, lighten up, man. I'm trying over here. <laughs> you can also join the Interverse Discord, but Rockfin has a way cool community aspect to it as well. I'm pretty sure. I'll explain that more in the future as I get into it, because I'm still really new to it. In fact, it's not even set up yet as I record this outro. I just needed to record an outro while I had the uh, electricity left in my battery to do it. Yeah. I mean, I'm not tired right now. Actually, I feel energized. Got my Moldavite on. That probably helps. It's a great crystal. If you want a tip on a crystal to wear that'll rock your world, pun intended, Moldavite's a good one. So anyway, I mentioned the Discord. One of the things that happened today in there that was really cool is one of our tribe, a, a cool guy named Ben McDonald, dropped a link to a track he had just produced on SoundCloud. He posted up there and I loved it. And I was like, this is way better than what I had intended to play for the outro of the Howdy episode. So here we go. I'm going to play us out with that. Um, you know, I didn't even mention what was in the plus extension of this episode. Seems important, but I'm just going to leave it up to your imagination. It was related topics. <laughs> we continued on the same vein and it was interesting. And there were more things to look at and we just kept going. So I hope you do check that out. And if you're checking it out through Rockfin, welcome, especially if you're a new listener, welcome. Great episode to jump in on, in my opinion, because this is some really fascinating stuff. Do your own research on it. Make up your own mind. I know people that aren't convinced that we have anything here, but I also don't know that they've looked into it past a certain point. Because the more I look at it, the more it piles up the feeling of like, yeah, yeah, this is this is amazing. And they're telling us a lie about what it came from. And anyway... What isn't, what hasn't been a lie about where such and such came from, right? So I'm going to play us out, though, with a, a track called Roll With It by Ben McDonald, a fellow traveler of the interversal path. And we expect nothing less but way more dank music from you, Ben, because I will continue putting it at outros if uh, you share it with me. So, you know, I like to feature the community a lot more than I like to feature random people. Not that I don't want to feature random people, but you get me. And this is legit good. Like, I'm not even kidding. You're going to like it. So I guess that's it. Sayonara. Don't forget. Patreon is still a thing, but Rockfin is way better. And uh, other ways to support the show would be to just jump in Discord and talk with us or leave a review on the iTunes podcast app, which, by the way, we've gone up in the rankings on that pretty considerably lately. Keep it going. And uh, with that, I'm going to sign off. Check the episode description for links to all that and more. And uh, thank you again, Ben, for sharing this cool song. We'll enjoy it. Much love, everybody. Bye-bye.